Okay, this is going to be a very, very boring recording because it's not slides, right? It's 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 just going to be me at terminal. Um, okay, we better get rid of those. Um, quick expert tip, all right? How to list all your containers out so you can get rid of them. You can see LXELS does that, but if you go minus C for columns, right? I can just list the name column name, and then I just get the names of my containers. If I don't want to have all of the fancy ASCII boxes around them, I can say list them in CSV format, and I just get the list of them like that. That's useful because now I can make a for loop for that and delete them all. For C in, oh, we're getting into programming now. For C in that list of containers, there. do deleting C, and then let's just delete it. LXC delete force C. Okay, this is a little bit of scripting. Um, run through all my containers and delete them all. It's slightly quicker for me to write the for loop than it is for me to type LXC delete for each of them. Okay, so now we're back to here. All right, no containers. Um, okay, so I think Stephen showed you yesterday how you'd start off by by going JIT clone to get these get these scripts here, and you start off by going into configs and creating yourself a file called containers.json, which you just copy off the sample. Um, little tip if you're struggling with DNS, um, I actually discovered this is quite useful to do for demos. If you make a Linode container, then Linode provides you with a okay, admittedly slightly, slightly cryptic um, name on their DNS server already. So, if I don't want to waste my calls, I, I have this thing registered as serveracademy.dhs2.org. But if I keep asking for certificates for serveracademy.dhs2.org, in the end, Let's Encrypt are going to say I'm making too many requests. Um, and if I make too many requests for the dhs2.org domain, it'll mean that other people who are trying to do serious things uh, will also be will reach that limit. And then Let's Encrypt basically bans you for a week from making any more requests. So. Sometimes it's useful just to use the Linode provided um, fully qualified domain name instead of, instead of using my own DNS. For demo purposes, this is fine. So basically you take this file and you only want to make three changes in it. You want to change the fully qualified domain name, to whatever it is is your main name, um, email address, this is just used for the, for the SSL request. Time zone is important. You should set your time zone, um, partly because it's very disruptive to set it afterwards, right? After your DHS has been running for a while, and then you change the time zone, all the logs get a bit confusing. Um, the other thing is quite important to make sure that all, the, all your containers are set onto the same time zone. Um, that's why we put it in there. If you want to know what's a valid time zone to use, um, they don't always, I'm still running as root here. Let's stop being rich. Um, time date control commands. You can, one of the things you can do, I think is list time zones. And I can pick where I am, Africa, Accra, or these are the time zones that my system knows about. So you pick one of those and put it in there, whichever one is suited to your environment. Once you have 
once you have that config file set up properly, then you can run this. And basically it's just going to run through your config file and make the containers. Now the scripts that do this are, I don't know, a little bit, a little bit ugly, I suppose. They're a bit fragile. Um, I keep trying to make them more robust and then find other edge cases that cause them to prang again. Um, anybody who's familiar with Ansible will realize that basically what I've done here is recreate what Ansible does really well anyway. So um, one of the things I hope to do and, and shortly over the next couple of weeks is to remove this create container script. Well, I won't remove it. It might still could be called a create container script, but instead of working off this config file, we'll instead turn it into an Ansible, Ansible inventory and create the containers that way. Doesn't make any difference in terms of what you end up being set up. Just It's just really the scripts to create the stuff in the first place. Having them all in an Ansible inventory does also provide you with some additional maintenance advantages as well. But for the moment, this is how it goes. It's good to run this command as sudo because there's a few things it needs to do, like setting firewall rules and the like, that it will, it will fail otherwise. Yeah, the actual setup, depending on your network, where you are, if you're on a cloud server, it should be reasonably quick. Um, takes, I, I think, about five minutes. Um, so we can just talk over it while that's happening. Um, it's going to create three base containers. It'll create your reverse proxy container with Apache 2 in it currently. It'll create a, um, a database container. I've changed this very, very recently so that it will create a container running Postgres 13. Um, I've discovered that slightly slower, setup time is a bit slower, Postgres 13. That's because it has to get the, it gets the Postgres packages from the official Postgres repository. And for some reason, that one seems to be slower. Um, but so instead of five minutes, it might be six or seven minutes. We'll see. Um, now you can do all of this manually, right? In fact, you don't have to follow my scripts at all. The only advantage, I guess, of going through, I've put a lot of time and effort into configuring the machines, particularly with, with reasonable security in mind. And some of those steps, you know, if you do it manually, you get lazy, you don't, or you don't remember, or you make mistakes or whatever it might be. One of the reasons for <coughs> automating the setup, and people always ask for easy setup, so either setup.exe. The point about an easy setup isn't to make it easy for dummies, right? Set up for dummies, anybody can do it. You don't need to know anything. You just run create containers and off you go. That's not the reason for making it easy to do. The reason for making it easy, easy to do is so that you can repeatedly install um, containers that are set up exactly the way that you've specified them to be. So, um, and from a security perspective, it stops you forgetting to do critical things. It's also useful for disaster recovery if you want to get your system back up and running really quickly. Um, if you were to type all of the commands here by hand, it would take you a day to do it instead of five minutes to do it. So, yeah, this looks like it's nearly done. Okay, it's got to make the it's got to make the monitor. So hopefully Stephen ran through this with you yesterday and didn't hit too many issues. Um, after it's created your basic infrastructure, then from there we can start creating Tomcat containers and running DHIS. Uh, before we do that, I guess we need to put the SSL on our, on our proxy. That's a step that causes lots of grief. All right, probably the number one problem we've had with people 
installing these things in the field. Clement who is probably the one who's had the worst luck with SSL. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've got to be really careful and work methodically, right? To make sure that your system is not hiding behind some kind of firewall, make sure everything is set up and your web server is available um, before you even attempt to do the SSL, right? Make sure your domain is working. And that's what we're gonna do now. Let's just have a quick look. Here's my containers. Kind of brief word about IP addresses. Um, you could change these, but I don't advise that you do because I might still have a few, a few hard coded tendencies that need to be fixed. Always run the proxy, zero two. Monitors running on zero 30 and Postgres is running on zero 20. And when I make my DHS two instances, I tend to make them the first one on 10, the next one on 11, the next one on 12, the next one on 13, etc. It doesn't really matter what IP addresses you choose for your Tomcat containers, but it's just, it's just a convention, I guess. If I keep them all 10, 11, 12, 13, etc., then it's very easy for me to see what they are. Um, so you can put your Tomcat containers on any IP address, really. These three, you should, as far as possible, keep them as the ones that we have set here for the moment. Don't get too adventurous changing the IP addresses. Some things might break. Okay, I talked a little bit about, about firewall settings. Um, you can have a look in. Okay, on each of these, on each of these, if I go into Postgres, for example, we should see that my Postgres should be running on 5432. There's another service running as well on 4949. That's the Moonin node. And if I look at the firewall status, firewall should be enabled. Whoops on each container and with fairly minimal rules. So currently the default setting on my Postgres container is you can't reach it at all. The only thing that can reach it is the monitor, right? So we know it's listening on 5432, but there's nothing, the, the, the firewall currently will block any access to it. Um, that's deliberate. When we create a new Tomcat container, part of the process of creating a Tomcat container, you see, we'll open up a firewall rule specifically for that container. Before we do Tomcat containers, let's quickly set up the SSL. I need to remember the weird main name that I'm gonna use, that's it. Right, at the moment, my proxy should be running. I should be able to access it, but it won't have any SSL on it. Let's go here. Um, and there it is, right? You're just seeing the Ubuntu default page. That's a really important test to do. Before you try to set up your SSL, make sure that you can actually access the proxy container because part of the process of requesting the certificate involves let's encrypt, trying to call back to make sure that you are indeed who you say you are. And if, if it can't reach you, it's gonna to fail to issue the certificate. And if it fails more than five times, something like that, um, actually I have the page here, so you can Google rate limits on let's encrypt, it'll get you to this page. It will tell you how many times you can try. Um, after that, it's going to ban you and you're going to be stuck for another week before you can get going again. So, yeah, do a quick test, right? A little warning to make sure you've done that test. Now I know that my container is actually reachable. For people who are curious, the reason why it's reachable is because of this. Part of the script has, has done this behind your back. The firewall rule, this is running on the host, which says anything coming in on port 80, send it straight through to the proxy. 
on port 80. Similarly, anything coming through on 443, send it straight through to the proxy on 443. So that's the reason why, even though my proxy is running in internally there on 192.168.02, I'm able to reach it from outside because my firewall is forwarding the connection for me. Okay, I'm happy now that the proxy is working. I'm not in it. What you might find, particularly if you're setting this up on a on a kind of physical network, maybe in your national data center or whatever it might be, you might find that you're getting blocked by an external firewall. So you want to verify all of those things first before you try to run the SSL setup. Again, you can do this manually. I've always done it manually until on the weekend I made a little script to make it easy for you. But have a, you can have a look yourself to see what the script does. But basically, it's just going to go. First of all, it's going to give me a big warning. Right? It's going to tell me all the things that I just told you. Right? Don't, don't proceed unless you can access it with your browser. Um, we've checked we can access it with the browser so let's go one i don't know how much people or people's understandings of ssl will vary but basically what happens here is that we generate the certificate signing request the certificate signing request is sent off to let's encrypt let's encrypt verifies the way it verifies is checks to see whether it can access your server after it's done that it'll issue you the certificate and you get congratulations notice um, and then we do a little bit of reconfiguration on apache it looks like i might have hmm, okay that's interesting i have a little error in there i don't know if anybody checked this Let's just quickly look. Is it running? Oh, there it is running, running port 80 and port 443. The other thing it should have done is it should have enabled my... My... Um, oh, not available, enabled. Yeah, it's it's enables this configuration here, which is the configuration that we need to run DHS to. So if I go back to where I was, go back to here. If I reload this page again, this time it should come back, and we get a little lock in the corner there to say that we have a certificate, we have a valid certificate. It's issued to this domain and it's valid from today for another three months. Okay, there's a whole lot of configuration of the SSL settings in the proxy which have gone on in the background. We can check them while, while we're talking. I'll just, let's just check SSL labs. This is usually where I go to check. Um, Where's the URL? It's this one. Copy. Good idea to test it and to give you some ideas about things you might have got wrong. It takes a couple of minutes. Oh, you have too many assessments. In. I've got 12. Oh, I've got 12 assessments in progress. That doesn't make sense. No, I don't. That's lying. Um, Hmm. Maybe it's because it's on a Linode. Maybe Linode, people on Linode have got too many assessments in progress. If I set it up as Server Academy, I'd be able to check it. We can try it again later. I did check it over the weekend, and SSL Labs comes back and gives us an A plus for the certificate, which is generally what you want to see. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about proxy and the Tomcat probably in our session next week so i don't want to go into a lot of detail yet let's just jump straight to the next thing you want to do is to install a couple of service scripts um 
you can see I've run this before. It's got a few things in it already. And then we can start running the DHIS to a specific script. So when I create an instance, create an instance, um, if I just do that, it'll give me some options. Let's create an instance called HMIS. It's common enough one. I can be specific about the IP address. Uh, or I think it should as a default if I don't specify it. I might have more than one Postgres container, um, but let's also specify the Postgres container just to be sure. And that's what it's going to do is going to make me a database. I'm going to talk about making a database or, or databases in the next session. And it's going to create me a Ubuntu based container again. Um, it's going to put Tomcat on it. And the Ubuntu security settings on Tomcat are really very, very good. Um, one of the things that I've done with, I tried to do with most of them, I think I've seen yesterday, I've gone through the CIS security checklists for things like Tomcat. And there's so many things to set up in terms of file permissions and the like, which I don't know, the, the Ubuntu installation does a much better job than certainly any of the Dockers that I've seen. <laughs> um, I could probably roll my own, but I like the I like the setup that Ubuntu has done on it. Um, well, I've made a few extras, made a few extra settings. I'll actually show you that in a bit. But let's let's get a DHIS up and running on it first. We need to deploy a WAR file. Um, I usually just go to DHIS downloads, find us a war file. Um, let's go with the latest and greatest. Public health warning, by the way, if you're working with a production instance, don't run this 235.1 war file. It's got some issues with it. There is a new release which is due out this week which fixes a lot of things. So my advice to you is to stick around with 234 until this new release comes out. Um, when I deploy a war file, I'm gonna play a link. That's what the minus L is. So get my war file from there and deploy it to, what do they call my instance? HMIS, I think. What happened? That didn't look like it deployed. Is this what Gerald was talking about the other day? <laughs> that doesn't look like it deployed it. Did I introduce a bug over the weekend? Um, yeah, I was introducing options and things. Did I make a download war file? Then it's meant to do this. It unzipped it. Is it deploying new war file? All of that. I didn't see any of that. I just got downloading the war file. Mm -hmm. Not getting a ah, it's because of this. <laughs> My no, it gets past all of that. It does this. This fails. Don't 
that shouldn't. It always happens when you're being recorded. Um, I might have. Did Stephen have a problem with this yesterday? I wonder. <laughs> did I make it? I. No, uh, Bob, yesterday I didn't have a problem. I think I used the sudo and was able to deploy. Uh, mm, do you think? Unless, you unless, you, unless you modified something. Yeah, but uh, yesterday it worked well using sudo. I shouldn't have to, I don't think. Let's try it. Let me just it straight away. What have I done? What have I done? What have I done? This always works. So what have I done? Link. Maybe the instance is deployed to. Well, this is a very, very simple script. Let's have a quick look. I added a bit more help text on here that wasn't there before. I wonder if that's causing me a problem. It shouldn't, because we get as far as here. Now, instance, we get as far as there. Um, I wonder if it's this exit. This trying to be clever. I think you, I think it's exit. <laughs> uh, I think this exit is being triggered, right? Yeah, I read it. Maybe I, I, I probably made that mistake yesterday afternoon when, when I got when I got uh, locked out. Um, so I was sitting here at home, didn't know what to do. Um, I started making a few fixes, and that obviously wasn't a fix. That was that broke it. <laughs> I had an extra exit in there. Um, okay, there's our HMIS container. It says that it's running. I've got a very useful command for looking at the logs. Minus F means to follow the log on HMIS. And we should see it coming up. Um, there's our DHIS2 starting. I'm going to advise you strongly that you use this DHIS2 log view command rather than trawling around looking for Catalina.out because it's got a lot of, because DHN, let me just quit for a moment. Um, the Tomcat on Ubuntu is using the journal, the system journal for logging, right? And the system journal gives you lots of, one of the nice options, I mean, minus F, as you've seen, is just to follow the log. That'd be like tail minus F, Catalina dot out. Um, you can also say, just show me all the logs for today. And it'll show me today's log. You can also say, show me the logs upside down. Sometimes you want to see what happened more recently first, rather than what happened ages ago. It'll show you the log upside down, so you can see the server started up, and this is what happened before the server started up. Um, yeah, we'll have an opportunity, I think, to talk about the logging and logging command later. But it's a it's a very flexible way of looking at your logs, um, particularly when you're you're looking for something that happened at at um, ten forty five today. You can you can isolate time periods, it's the kind of thing. It's a little bit trickier to do with. You can say, show me everything that's happened since 10.45 until 10.46, all right? So you can look at a time period in your log. Mm. 
Okay, I do need to say which DHIS instance I want to look at. That'll show me just that one minute's worth of log from 10.45 through to 10.46, hopefully. Um, that's the last thing that happened. So it seems like it started up, it seems like it's running. Let's see if we can find it. Um, where did I go to it? Here. So each instance, once you create the instance, it'll appear like that on a, hmm, there we go, um, with its own name after the URL. Now, obviously in a production environment, you probably don't want to see the Apache landing page every time, like this, whoops, like this. And that look very amateur. Uh, there are two approaches people tend to do on it. <coughs> One is they just customize the page. I know particularly places which are running quite a lot of DHS2 instances, they make like a little menu here with a maybe a little bit of, of background on whatever you, what different systems are. Um, you can do that, you can customize this page, or you can just decide which of your Tomcat instances you want to appear as the default. Um, I've got a little line, you just need to comment out to do that. Let's just do that one last thing. I'm gonna leave the installation alone. Okay, so quick public health warning. I introduced a bug into DHS to log view yesterday afternoon when I was offline. I'm gonna fix that in the next five minutes, but let's first of all, it's that extra exit in there that I didn't wanna see. Um, if I go into my proxy and I go into no, we'll use a local, sorry. Um somewhere down here, uh, there we go. I got a rewrite rule that's commented out sometimes it's something that people really want to do. Rewrite everything that comes to the root, make that instead go to my HMIS. I'll get rid of the landing page because every time I try to get to the landing page, it's instead it's going to send me there. Um, let's just reload it. Generally with Apache, also with Nginx, um, when you make these configuration settings, it's not usually necessary to restart the server. You just need to reload it. Uh, let's go back here. If I load this URL again, it should just redirect me. Yeah, okay, boom. Okay, so the Apache landing page is gone. So as I say, people take one of two approaches. They're either gonna do that or they're gonna create their own custom landing page for it. Um, while we're at it, Okay, we can't, it's not going to allow me, is it? Yeah, that's a shame. I really wanted to show you that we got an A plus on that. But, uh, I'd have to put it back to serveracademy.dhs2.org and check it. Okay, lads, lassies. That's basically the kind of installation and setup process. What we're going to go on to be talking about over the coming sessions and over the coming weeks is now what you do with it, right? How you maintain it, what are the things to consider, what kind of extra things you might need to do. Um, but to actually just get up and running, that's what's involved. Um, I did promise to show you a little bit of firewall rules. I'll just do that. For... If we look at our uh, um, instance, this is our DHIS instance, it's running there now. You'll see that um, we're allowing access to the Tomcat that's running on 8080. We're allowing it from the proxy, and we're also allowing it, in fact, from the host machine. Reason for allowing it from the host is just sometimes you want to do curls and W gets and things from the host. It's just convenient. But otherwise, so for example, if I if I create two containers, they won't be able to access the 8080 on each of them. The only thing that can really access your 8080 is your proxy. Similarly, if we look at the database server, um, I'll talk about a lot of databases next. Again, let's have a quick look. 
you can see that we've got a firewall rule now which will allow access to the database from that container right we need to do that it has to be able to get through the firewall so we'll make a rule for it but in addition to that you know that generally the um Missions on Postgres access controls are set in here. You see, we've got a little line in here which says that the HMIS user is allowed to access the HMIS database if he's coming from this particular IP address and with MD5, which is providing a username and password as happens with our JDBC connector. So yeah, all these little things, you know, if you're doing them manually, um, it's quite hard. But if you're doing it automatically, you can set up fairly tight security rules between your containers. Okay. That's a second run through of the setup. Um, and the reason why the second run, run through is slightly different to Yesterday is because I made a supposed fix yesterday, which I now need to fix again. And that I see Gerald has been complaining that the LXD, the, the DHS to deploy war doesn't work. Sorry, Gerald, you've just found the same problem I've been having as well. It's a problem I introduced yesterday afternoon. I'll fix it again, as I say, in the next couple of minutes. If there's any other questions on installation, um, has anything been happening in Slack while I was talking? Let's have a look. Now we see the issue. Yes, Gerald. <laughs> yes, you were not going mad. You were absolutely right. Sorry about that. Okay, Gerald, I'll fix it very quick. Um, just as a as a General point, I don't know Morton asked me this once before. Kind of long term, once you've got everything installed, um, I need to share my screen again. Just going to do this for two minutes and then we're going to take a break. Once you have everything installed, yeah, um, it's a good idea. This is what I'm going to ask you to do in a short time. It's a good idea to regularly just do a jiggle. Um, sorry, it's up to date. Because one of the things that, I mean, like in this case, that I'm going to make sort of regular fixes to or improvements to um, will include, in fact, the Unix man pages, which are coming. But that script is sitting here. It's in there, right, under the service script. So. Um, in a couple of minutes after I fixed it, I will commit it to GitHub. You just need to just run git pull again, and it's going to update your service scripts. And then you just need to run this again. That'll make sure that you always have the most current version of the service scripts. Um, it won't overwrite settings that you've already made. Right, it's all, the only thing that it will do, it'll it will overwrite the the service scripts with the latest versions. And I think I'm going to fix that in the next five or ten minutes during the break. <laughs> 